guest is uh, someone I'm proud to call my friend. Uh, he's a leader of uh, Israeli tech sector. Um, I've seen him in action as the most passionate and effective advocate of the country's economy and the country's innovative spirit. He himself is a serial entrepreneur, venture capitalist, and angel investor. I met him about 15 years ago uh, when um, I was involved in what's called the Brand Israel Group. He was then active with his Israel Seed Partners, which he founded in 1995. John Medved is the CEO of Our Crowd, founded in 2013. It's an equity crowdfunding platform that connects its crowd of accredited investors to funding startup investments. To date, 160 and even more startups benefited from this network of investors and over $1 billion were raised. Uh, John Medved lives in Jerusalem with his family, but originally he was born in San Diego, raised in Los Angeles, and attended UC Berkeley. So there's a very, very strong California connection. He is uh, one of four. We will talk about his family and his upbringing. I had a chance to meet two of his brothers, Michael Medved, who's a very well-known radio personality and film critic, and Harry Medved, who actually wrote a book about Oak Park, California, which is also something that uh, has a connection to my own, uh, my own family. In the book, Startup Nation, uh, which gave this session its, its, um, its title, uh, John Medved is described as follows. One of Israel's legendary business ambassadors, Medved has taken on a role that in any other country would typically belong to the local Chamber of Commerce, Ministry of Trade, or foreign secretary. Uh, and with that, welcome John Medved. Thank you, Ido. That's an over the top and lovely intro. I really appreciate it. <laughs> and I'll it's mention to my brother, Harry, that you uh, gave a shout out to Oak Park. That's the best of all. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, California is also part of my, my, my biography. So tell us, first of all, how a kid that was born in San Diego ends up being a high-tech entrepreneurship guru in Jerusalem. Well, what else am I going to do? <laughs> Look, I, I grew up in a pretty typical Southern California uh, Jewish home, and that was Jewish with a small J. Uh, I went to Hebrew school. I was actually expelled from Hebrew school. So if your kids are giving you trouble, God forbid, in religious school, there's hope for them yet. Uh, and... Um, I really, you know, I came from a warm Jewish family, but we were considered in our neighborhood fanatics because we had a Passover Seder. It wasn't called Pesach, it was called Passover in my community. There were lots of Jews, but they didn't Jew much. Um, and I was very political. I was active in the anti-war movement uh, against the Vietnam War. I went to work for Cesar Chavez and the farm workers. I tutored kids in the Inglewood ghetto. Uh, I ran it. I actually started my first political campaign walking precincts for Bobby Kennedy in 68, uh, the uh, campaign that he had, was assassinated uh, in LA at the Ambassador Hotel. And I ultimately ran a district office for George McGovern. So I went to Berkeley. I was a little bit too conservative for Berkeley because being involved in democratic politics meant I was, for many of my uh, comrades at, at Berkeley, was on the fascist side of the line. Uh, and, but I had never done anything Jewish. I never belonged to a Jewish youth group, never went to a Jewish camp. I just hadn't. And uh, after my freshman year, I was looking to go abroad and hang out somewhere. And I talked to my parents because I didn't have money to go abroad. And I said, well, you'll pay for me to go study Spanish and Barcelona or uh, in, in Madrid. And they looked at me and said, are you nuts? The only place we'll pay for you to go is to Israel, where you've got cousins and where you need to get some Jewish finishing. And I thought about it and I said, you know, okay, I'll do it. And so I went now, to Israel. At that school. point, uh, how old are you at that point? Uh, it's 1973. And at that point, I am 17 years old, 18 years old. Okay. And I went to uh, Israel for the summer and absolutely loved it. It was a magical, wonderful time between 67 and 73. 
And I came back, I actually wanted to stay because I had met some really cool Israelis who were my madrichim, my, my counselors on the program. And they offered me to come down to Sinai and play volleyball and drink vodka on the Suez Canal. And luckily I didn't accept them on their offer. Uh, I don't know how in the hell they were able to invite me down there anyway, but such was Israeli life in those days. I went back to Berkeley and then watched on TV Israeli soldiers being led out of these bunkers on the canal, freaking out and totally getting outraged by huge rallies that were called for on Sproul Plaza, death to the Jews. Okay, it wasn't like death to the Zionist entity or some kind of euphemism. It was basically kill the Jews. And I went to Hillel House where I found a, a few dozen uh, other Jews who were like upset and we went to work. And so I became a campus Zionist activist, uh, Israeli advocate, if you call it that, you know, a little bit before my time. And this was in 73. I was so into it that in 1975, I was recruited by the Jewish agency to go organize campuses around the West Coast. They gave me an old car, all the propaganda I could use and a 16 millimeter film projector to show propaganda movies. And I loved it, it was great. And then I went to New York for a couple of years. I kept on leaving school uh, and worked for the Jewish agency running something called AZYF. And ultimately I, I got through my schooling and I decided that I wanted to actually fulfill Zionism, at least as I understood it, and come live in Israel. And I moved there in 1980. What an incredible journey from San Diego all the way to, to Jerusalem. And, and what are your, your first encounters in Israel? So here you are arriving from the United States, a staunch Zionist. You spend a summer in Israel, but really you didn't really know intimately Israeli mentality, Israeli society, the way Israelis do business. What was your first impression? What was your well, I mean, first was, difficulty? Was, I was very lucky because uh, I had two first cousins who had moved there. Uh, my late uncle, uh, Uncle Moish, Moshe Dov, um, he had changed his name from Medved to Dov in Hebrew is bear. Medved means bear in Russian. And uh, his two daughters lived there and they took really good care of me. And they both had four little kids who spoke not a word of English. So I spent most of my time hanging out in their kitchen, sleeping on their couches and playing with their kids. And so my introduction to Israeli culture was through the eyes of children. And they were the coolest, they still are. They're adults today with their own kids. But it was just this wonderful sort of, you know, glimpse into the Israeli family. Uh, one of my cousins was a guy named Ehud Netzo, probably Israel's most famous archeologist, discovered the tomb of King Herod and whatnot. And he would take me together with his family, uh, you know, into the most bizarre archeological digs. And it was exploring the country and it was, taking moonlight hikes from Jerusalem down to Jericho through Vadi Kelt. And it was, you know, going to these amazing beaches and chasing the most incredible women ever. I'm sorry, I don't know if I'm allowed to say that in, in an in a, uh, era, but I was a kid, I was 18, I was, I was allowed to do it. Um, it was just fun. I, I, I thought Israel was fun. And I also, was moved Jewishly. I mean, I wasn't, at that point, I wasn't observant in any way. And, you know, but I, I just liked the culture and it resonated with me. So I went back and when I went back to uh, Cal, that's when the politics hit me. I mean, it was the, the up and then the down. And I felt like I was, um, I, I was called, you know, in other words, like all of a sudden all this political stuff, I, I mean, I knew how to write a press release. I knew how to organize a district campaign office. I knew how to get people to a demonstration. And these skills were needed by the Jews on the campus. And that's that's what I did. And frankly, that's all I've done ever since. I mean, you think about my, I didn't get an MBA. Okay, I, I studied history in school and I've just been organizing. I'm a, you know, it was good enough for Barack Obama. I guess it's good enough for me. He was a community organizer, so was I. Absolutely. If it's he was also a lawyer, him, by the way, which yes. I not, never, <laughs> never got done. Now, when was it when you 
uh, decided that you're going to um, capitalize, for lack of a better word, on Israel's creative spirit? When was it the first time you realized that's what I want to do in life? Well, I, I was very fortunate to be a beneficiary of a very old Jewish tradition called nepotism. Uh, my late father, Dr. David Medved, was an entrepreneur. He had uh, been active in a startup which was actually bought by Xerox in the 60s. And by 1980, when I moved to Israel, he was messing around with something that no one understood called fiber optic communications. He decided he wanted to come visit me in 1982, about a year and a half into my journey in Israel. And he shows up and he says, look, son, I, I want to write off this trip as a business expense, but I got to do a little business. So I've been corresponding with some guys up at this missile plant called Raphael up in the north. Of course, this is the place now that's famous for the Iron Dome and whatnot. And he said, will you come with me to this meeting? So I schlep up, you know, to drive north of Haifa in my old beat up car with my father, having fun talking to him. We get to this meeting and they start talking fiber optics and they could have been talking Chinese. I mean, I would have understood more if it was Chinese. And at the end of this hour and a half of torture, where I didn't have an iPhone. I couldn't read a book that would be impolite, but I had to sort of smile. My, my cheeks were getting, you know, stressed from smiling <laughs> me, 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 without any meaning. One of the guys takes mercy on me and, and turns to me in Hebrew and says, no, medved, what, what are you, you know, what are you doing? And I told him I'm doing a little bit of tour guiding and I was working for actually the labor party, helping organize young people. And I was doing a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And he looks at me and he says in Hebrew, bizbuz totali, okay, a complete total <laughs> waste. And I felt like I was slapped. I mean, why aren't you dancing the horror with me? I'm home, okay? I'm fulfilling the Zionist dream. You're telling me my life is a waste? I mean, I, I responded to him in Hebrew, mapitom, you know, which in, in English probably means other things. But in, in any event, um, he says, no, you don't get it. Guys like you, Askanim, we have a dime a dozen, okay? People like your dad, entrepreneurs, we don't have enough. This is 1982. And he goes, we need fiber optics. Go help your dad build a factory in Israel. So on the way back uh, from Haifa, I turned to my father and said, look, dad, what do you do exactly? Can you, can you begin to explain this to me? <laughs> And he said, son, it starts with Ohm's law, which of course I knew nothing about. And make a long story short, by the end of this week that my father was there in the country, he offered me $100 a month to stay in touch with these guys at Raphael, and to open up some you know, opportunities with Israel aircraft. And uh, I fell in love with business. I, I found myself a mentor, a guy who I played poker with one day a week and maybe two or three days a week would teach me a little bit about optics and fiber and things like that. And ultimately I decided that I would raise money for my father because he didn't know how to raise money. He was a, you know, a scientist, but not a business person that way. And uh, I found the first investment I ever found from a company called ECI Telecom. It was their first investment. Uh, the late Mayor Laser, who was their CEO, invested $600,000, which even in retrospect, seems like a lot of money back then. And they bought a minority stake in my company. And then he proceeded to send me back to the US where I had to drag my new bride, Jane, to go. Uh, and I, I, I told her, I said, it'll be about a year until you know, we get rich. And I, I completely under, misunderstood that. But uh, you, it, that started a whole journey, which ended in 1990 when our company was bought by Amoco, the big oil company, which is today uh, British Petroleum, and I had my first exit. And that's how I started. Now, let me, now you're, you're quoted very generously in Startup Nation and other books and, and newspaper stories and interviews and so on. I'm asking you now a question from 30,000 feet above. When you're looking at the Israeli um, system, what would you say are the main positives for someone like you making Aliyah from 
North America trying to become an, an entrepreneur? What are the positives and what are the negatives? Well, first of all, it's really open and friendly. Okay, Israel is the most networked and easily networkable place in the world. Especially if you're a new immigrant, people will give you a break generally. And I found that there were very few people, even the big, whether it was Uzziah Galil or Shimon Eckhaus, or I was able to call leading people on a cold call and they'd say, sure, let's have coffee. I'll give you some advice. You have to know how to, you know, get them to open up. But I found this to be the most wonderfully open place where everybody knew each other and was positive. And they liked the, uh, you know, they liked the idea that I was a young person from California who was throwing my lot in with Israel. Now, just to give people a little historical perspective, in 1982, there was no venture capital in Israel. The first venture capital fund in Israel was established in 1986. And there was one fund called the Athena Fund. Note, note the name, they wouldn't call it the Jerusalem Fund. It was called after Athens. And it lasted for six years as the single fund. They would do one or two deals a year. And if you were lucky enough, you got the money. And that was it. That was the degree to which you know I was early in this stuff. Um, so what I liked was the fact that people had fun. They were bright, brilliant, and they never said never. Okay, like whatever you dreamed of, uh, I think my friend Muli Eden from Intel said it best. The way to you know get a Israeli team really motivated is tell them that what they're trying to achieve is impossible. Then they get off their butts and really start to work. Okay, because and and that's incredible. In terms of negatives, we were far from the action, right? In other words, the action was in Silicon Valley, and I can't tell you how many times people said, "Why are you leaving the states? Are you getting want to make money? You're in business." you know, join our venture fund, do, and, you know, not, not often, but occasionally I would think what would have my life been like had I stayed in California and, you know, stayed up in the valley. I am so lucky that I came to Israel because, you know, life is more than, than venture capital and investment and technology. It turns out Israel was a heck of a good place to do that. Uh, probably the, one of the best places in the world, certainly next to Silicon Valley, but to raise a family, to have grandchildren, to have friends, to feel fulfilled, to be proud, to have a sense of contribution, can't, can't, never could have done better. I just, I look back and say, boy, was I lucky, you know, that uh, someone was taking care of me. It's got to be school to vote. It's got to be, you know, some ancestor in my past who's uh, protecting me because it's just uh, a, a series of very, very fortunate things that led my life so far to be, you know, wonderful, and I'm very happy with it. Hello. Now you have some glorious chapters in in your in your history. Can you hear me? I, I hear you. Yes. You have some glorious chapters in your in your business history, Israel Seed Partners, Bringo, and our crowd. Our crowd was established in 2013, um, as it represents a, a very very interesting concept at the time, revolutionary. Uh, tell us about what led to the creation of this concept. How does the system work? So again, it sort of goes back to my roots. I never stopped being a campus activist. And all through my business career, I've been very active in terms of telling the Israeli story, such that the way that they described it in uh, uh, Startup Nation. So uh, when I built my prior company to our crowd, which was Vringo, and I took it public on the New York Stock Exchange, my board begged me and said, stop giving all these speeches about Israeli tech. You're running a mobile publicly traded software company. You know, every week you're going off to some Jewish group or a non-Jewish group and talking about Israel. What does this do for our stock price? Okay, that's not what we're, and I said, no, I, I've got to do that. But as soon as we 
merged the company and I was able to exit this company successfully, the first thing I did is I told my wife, I'm going on a long speaking tour. And I actually went for three different speaking tours, one to Asia, one to the US, one to Europe. And one thing in common happened on these speaking tours. People started giving me business cards and saying, get me in a deal. Because they said, okay, I'm get it. I get the startup nation thing. I want to play it. I want to invest. And I looked at them and said, but I don't run a venture capital fund anymore. I'm, I'm just out of my last deal. I'm thinking about my next move and I, I can't help you. And they said, no, you can help me. You're, a, you're an angel. You're a connected guy. You know all these tech people. Find me a deal where I can put 50K or 100K and invest. And so these business cards started filling literally shoe boxes after I would scan them. And I started looking at them and my wife yelled at me and told me to throw them away. And I said, no, I think there's actually gold there. And I th thought, wait a minute, there's this thing called crowdfunding. In 2012, the Obama administration passed the Jobs Act, which wasn't named after Steve Jobs, but it was jumpstart our business startups. And it was about opening up access to venture capital. I said, wait a minute, I can build a platform that will allow individuals to buy into startups and to help them the way that they buy stocks. And so that began a whole process of examining the regulatory regime, spending a lot of times uh, with my friends in the legal profession to make sure that what I was doing would meet you know, regulations. And we started in 2013, haven't looked back. And today we're actually at a billion and a half of committed funds. We've invested in 220 companies. We have 22 funds. We give people the choice to either invest in a specific company or in a, a, a portfolio. And we've been named by PitchBook for the last two years as the most active venture investor in Israel, which is a big deal, especially since we do it with this democratic platform. Can you share with us some of the gems that you helped uh, give birth to or help support yeah, I mean, it, it, look, the, the, the wonderful thing is that I'll, I'll give you a story now about a company that we're just getting ready to invest in and how unbelievable Israel is. Uh, we're getting ready to invest in a company called Blue Green Technologies. And this company has a essentially a fix for toxic algae blue. Now, I don't know if you've seen in these lakes and rivers, algae forms and it it becomes poisonous, kills animals. Turns out that in Botswana, 300 elephants just died a couple of weeks ago from one of these things. And this company has figured out how to put this special magical formula, which is absolutely safe, into the water. And within days, the algae is gone. So literally, this company is on the way now to one of the states in America, I won't give you too much detail, where the lakes are rising because of rainfall in the Southeast. And they need to release the water, which is infected into the you know, uh, watershed. And they're desperate for an Israeli company to come in and to mitigate this because we have the best solution in the world. And when you think about that, and you think about the brilliant technology that Israel has, how it's saving the planet, how it's helping the US, how we're gonna make, I hope, a lot of money on this investment, it, it doesn't get better than that, right? In other words, this is not something I've actually put the money into yet. We're hopefully gonna have it up on our crowd in a couple of uh, days. So you know, come to our website, www.ourcrowd.com and sign up and you can see how we do things. But the ability to back people with these dreams and to make good things happen according to what I call the double bottom line, which is doing good and doing well, right? In other words, there is no impact investing doesn't mean sacrificing profit. There's nothing wrong with profit. You should give sadaka. You should, you know, do great things with your wealth, but create jobs create businesses that are sustainable. But so many of the businesses we back are helping people. We were investors in Rewalk, which allows people, you know, paraplegics to walk again with robotic legs when public. 
We are investors in an American company called Beyond Meat, whose stock has been on a tear, right? They're the leader in plant-based meat, reduces greenhouse gases. It's a wonderful, you know, what's wrong with that? Okay, it's, it actually tastes good, okay? And we got in as a private investor before the IPO. Okay, we've uh, invested in Climacell, which is an Israeli company providing more accurate weather prediction models for farmers and companies, or even poor people in India who've never had that kind of prediction capability. You know, it, it goes on and on. There's so many companies that have a mission that are not just to make money, but are to solve even the secu cyber security problems. I mean, you know, these hackers are, are horrible, okay, in terms of stealing people's identity or stealing companies' money with ransomware. And what we're doing in terms of protecting the world, when you look today at Israel and all of the areas that we're leading in, whether it's cybersecurity or digital health or drones or ag tech or robotics or everything artificial intelligence, it's, it's breathtaking. And around the world, people recognize that Israel is this incredible place. And right now, we're all over the, 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 uh, you know, this new relationship with, with the Gulf. And you see this incredible uh, ability to work with our, uh, our neighbors for the first time on the dream of innovation and investment. It's great. Somebody was asking, by the way, uh, how do we spell the website? It's Our Crowd, O-U-R-C-R-O-W-D. There was a book by Stephen Birmingham written about the Jewish uh, bankers of New York, the German Jewish bankers, the Zeligmans and whatnot, and they were called Our Crowd. So we wanted something that implied crowdfunding and a little Jewy, not too Jewy, okay? And that's how we came up with the name. So it's O-U-R-C-R-O-W-D.com. It's, now, it's Jonathan, in July yes. of 2010, you may not remember that, but I remember this very vividly. Uh, we both addressed the Hadassah, Hadassah National Convention in Hollywood, Florida. And I was supposed I was following you and I was sitting in the audience listening to you and you did something very, very uh, bold and courageous. And I think it was very, very profound. You addressed the members of Hadassah, thousands of people in the room, thousands of people. And you gave them a very passionate speech about Israel. And then you started telling them about a company that is owned by Hadassah calling Hadassit. That's the name of the company. It's a research, medical research company traded on NASDAQ. And then you turned to them and you said, how many of you are invested in Hadassit? And not a finger was raised, not even one. And I'll never, I'll never forget that moment because to me, it was an epiphany. I realized that diplomacy had to be more about marketing rather than advocacy and litigation. And um, what is it that we can do in order to break that psychological barrier that exists among Jews and non-Jews in the United States elsewhere when it comes to Israel? Because Israel is associated in people's minds with hard geopolitical circumstances. Well, first of all, it's interesting. Um, not among Chinese, not among Japanese, not among Indians, not among people in Latin America. I mean, it seems as though among many Jews, it's like the first topic is, wait, how do you build startups in a country with so much conflict? It's not among our, our partners now in, in the Gulf, okay, who are so interested. Israel has turned out to be a great place to invest. Uh, there are, you know, over a hundred different venture capital funds active. This past year, okay, in uh, 2019, eight billion, uh, 200 million dollars was invested in Israeli startups, over eight billion dollars. This year, it's going to be over 10 billion dollars invested. How do I know? Because we're already at over seven and a half in the first three quarters and the fourth quarter is strong. We're growing the business during COVID. 
Now, how big is this? Okay, I'll give you a sense of size. Well, you take all the US military aid, including the special subsidies for Iron Dome and whatnot, that's less than 4 billion. You take all of the charity, which is incredibly important, as is the military aid, by the way. If you take all the charity, the hospitals, the universities, the Jewish agency, the joint, the JNF, you know, you roll it all into one, that equals about $3 billion. So already last year, the investment in Israeli startups was greater than all the US military aid and all of the charity combined. This year, it will be considerably greater. And yet, most of us don't do it. We are not involved. Because if you're not in this game, if you're not a tech person or an angel investor or know vent what venture capital is, it's alien to you. You know, it's hard enough to go buy an ETF or a mutual fund or buy Apple or Amazon stock. Okay, how in the heck am I supposed to buy a startup? So that's why we set up our crowd and there are other platforms like that that make it now pretty simple, right? You go to these sites, you look at the information. We do all the work in terms of, you know, selecting the investments and negotiating terms because these companies don't have prices. But the key thing about making these connections is not just the investment, it's the connection. It's the fact that you're part of solving some of these problems. We're investing now in the world's leading oral vaccine for COVID, okay? A company called Migvax. You know where Migvax is headquartered? In Kiryat Shmona, okay? This is a company building the North out of a research institute that I'm sure most of your uh, viewers today have never heard of. It's called Migal, 400 researchers, one third PhDs up in the North. And these guys had found a way to fight another kind of coronavirus that had plagued Israel's chickens. Now, if you know about Jews and our chickens, we, we take chickens seriously, okay? And Migal was tasked with developing a vaccine for chicken coronavirus. And when the human coronavirus came out, all of a sudden we had a head start. And this, by the way, vaccine, which is now in animal studies, will soon be in human studies, basically is oral so it can feed the world. So it doesn't have to be this super cool minus 50 degree stuff. Okay, it's not gonna be expensive. It's, it's a, a huge gift. How cool will that be when the world gets healthy from uh, Israeli chicken soup? Okay, I mean, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a just a great story. So these things are about not just writing a check, but getting involved. Because if your brother-in-law works at Cedar sinai in LA, or your nephew is graduating from NYU you know, medical school, okay? Or whatever it is, you now have this ability to connect to Israel in a, in a deeper, more effective way. And everybody can connect, whether it's you're in the art business or you're in the music business or you're in the cloud or software or robotics. And, and let's face it, today's young people are interested in innovation and technology. And the fact that Israel is the most, is the startup nation, is along with Silicon Valley, undisputed leader in terms of these kinds of uh, you know, companies that are forming. And by the way, what we're seeing when, you know, certainly before the COVID crisis, was just this massive flow of young people coming to intern in Israel. And they weren't all Jews, they were, many Indian Americans and Chinese from China and people of all origins and all wanting to come to Israel because they want to be part of this. And this is exactly what Israel needs is this influx of young people with young ideas, you know, continuing to develop the next stage of this, of this story. Yeah. You know, um, when we looked at Israel's tourism, for example, uh, in 2005, I believe it was Ernst & Young that said, realistically, Israel should be able to, uh, to handle 10, 15 or track 10, 15 million tourists a year. The number before COVID-19 was around four and a half, five million tourists. Right. Realistically speaking, given all the innovation that came out of Israel 
and all the innovation that will come out of Israel in the future, what is the ability of Israel realistically to attract foreign direct investment? So uh, you said it's, it's $10 billion this year. It's $10 what billion should it this be? year. It, it's going to keep on going up. And it, as long as it's growing at 20 or 30% a year, that's great. You know, whether it gets to 20 or 30 or 40 billion, right now it's going to go through the roof because of our relationship with the Gulf. Okay, we're talking, we just announced last week a $100 million deal with the uh, Al Nabuda Group, it was the first major uh, venture deal announced. Uh, we've been on this because I, I was down in Abu Dhabi in, in December of last year before the uh, normalization. And I remember when I was invited to speak there, I asked the organizers. I said, this is a, a conference sponsored by the government uh, through their um, uh, sovereign wealth fund. Do you mind if I talk about Israel? They said, what do you think we're inviting you for? We want to hear about Israel. Okay? <laughs> and, I, and, and I knew that things were, were, were happening there. Um, I'm, I'm seeing the questions, by the way. Should I try to integrate some of my answers with some no, of these uh, questions? We have, we have um, Ari. Yeah, Ari is compiling the questions for me in a separate uh, document, um, which is a wonderful segue. We can jump right into the questions because they are very, very good. Okay, so um, yeah, by the way, my I good see friend Yoram is asking. I, I, I see Irene, by the way, knew exactly what I was talking about in terms of Florida. It is uh, Lake O that we're going to work on, by the way, uh, Irene. Uh, and uh, the, the, that company is. Uh, called Blue Green Technologies. And uh, people were asking, how do you join these investments? Just go to our website. You go to rcrowd.com. Anybody, by the way, who you know needs additional help, just send me an email. I'm John, J-O-N, short for Jonathan, at ourcrowd.com. You can get it from Edo. If afterwards I can get your, your emails, I'll be happy to send you a link. Um, it's really simple. The minimum investment, by the way, in these companies is $10,000. You have to be, according to US law, an accredited investor, which means you have to have a million dollars of net worth outside of your primary dwelling or a $200,000 income. But I imagine many people living in New York and uh, having real estate or paying rent have that kind of income. Um, many don't. Well, but, Jonathan, uh, I would love to, um, to move to the Q&A session um, we have a wonderful question from Yoram, which I'd like to expand a bit. Yoram um, is asking, what are the next two, three areas for big Israeli wins in the future? Um, you know, it's, it's really interesting. The, the biggest win so far was, of course, Mobileye, which wasn't obvious, right? Mobileye is the company that leads in collision avoidance. It's an automotive technology company. And today, what's amazing is Israel's become Motown, right? In other words, the, all of the key executives, especially on the R&D side of automakers from Europe or Japan or Korea or even Detroit are making regular pilgrimages to Israel. Because as our cars increasingly become autonomous or essentially become sort of smartphones or computers on wheels with hundreds of chips, Israel has tremendous technology in the imaging, cameras, advanced sensors, like we have a company called Innoviz that does you know, laser-based radar. We have a company called Fortelix, which does uh, simulation of these autonomous systems. You know, so that's one area, mobility, okay, which is great. We have a, a company uh, offering flying pods on a a simple rail that takes a day to uh, be assembled so it flies above the road. And um, this is for urban environments. Uh, our largest investor alongside of us is the Reliance conglomerate from India. It's gonna solve, it's sort of beyond autonomous cars. So that mobility is one. Another big area is food. Now it's not just because I'm a, a lover of food, just take a look at me, okay? I like to eat, uh, but the reality is that you know, food tech, ag tech are really important for the future of the planet. And whether it's plant-based replacements, okay, we, we just completed an investment in another American company called Ripple, who make this incredible uh, plant-based milk, you know, replacement competes with Oatly and people like that. 
Um, it can be growing fish tissue from cell lines. Okay, so we have a company called Blue and Nalu, which is, you know, growing, uh, there are people growing meat in this country. We're trying to get into a, a deal called Olive Farms. Um, so food is going to be, we have a wonderful company, it was just profiled in the New Yorker. How many Israeli companies get a big profile in the New Yorker? Two weeks ago, our company Duma Tok, which is creating a new way of producing natural sugar. It's not an artificial sweetener, which is more potent than regular sugar. Therefore, you need only 60%. So you can actually reduce your sugar intake by 40% and get the same taste. And this, by the way, big article in uh, New Yorker, wonderful piece about Duma Tok. So I'm into food. And finally, um, the area that's probably most exciting today is in digital health and medical everything. The, the wonders that are coming out of Israel, not just fighting uh, you know, this uh, terrible scourge of COVID, but fighting cancer. We have a company called Alpha Tau who are shooting radioactive darts with a new kind of radiation called alpha radiation directly into tumors. And in their first human trials, all 51 patients had their tumors shrunk and 40 of them had the tumor totally disappeared. Okay, which is, you know, this, un and it's, you basically just shoot the little dart in and boom. Okay, um, company called Insight Tech, who are using focused ultrasound to essentially solve problems with, associated with Parkinson's and essential tremor. Someone comes in and cannot hold a cup of tea, give us one second zap in the brain, which is guided by magnetic resonance, by MRI, and all of a sudden that person comes out and his hand is like this. And you basically want to shout hallelujah, okay? And people do, because it's it, extraordinary. We had, by the way, people who experience this come to our annual summit. Before COVID, we, we have a big, a big shindig in Jerusalem called the Our Crowd Summit, which you're all invited to join. We don't charge you anything. And uh, 23,000 people registered this year. It was in February. We managed to pull it off without infecting. And, and there were people who had told their stories about how they had been cured by this stuff. There are companies like Zebra Medical who are making uh, AI-driven uh, analysis of radiological images for mammograms, for brain bleeds, for uh, osteoporosis. I mean, it's just, it's endless, okay? We have 220 companies. There are approaching 10,000 startups in Israel. There are over 100 funds. There are now 400 multinationals. You know, you know how much money, by the way, Edo, Intel has invested in Israel over the last two decades? Hazard a guess. What do you think has been the total Intel investment? 10 billion? 50 billion. 50, that's including the 15 billion they paid for Mobileye, but they just bought Habana Mobileye. for 2 billion. Yeah. They bought Move It for a billion. This is just in the last year or two. Okay, but they put $50 billion into Israel. Now here's the, the Shonda though. There's a, a little bit of a, a criticism. You told the story about Adasa, so I'm gonna do a little bit of that now. One of the biggest problems is that the Jewish institutional foundational world doesn't get this yet. And so when you take all of the money under management by Jewish foundations, less than 1% of this money is invested in Israel. It's really a, a scary thing. And it's not just because that doesn't align with the, you know, the goals of the Jewish foundation, but it's the sense that, well, you know what, we've got to put money into something safe and we'll then give the money away to Israel as a tzedakah and charity. Israel is safe, okay? Israel is a good, wonderful place, not just to live, but to invest. And therefore, we've got to work on our Jewish communal foundations all over the world and the various Jewish uh, foundations that are out there to increase their allocation to investments across the board, but to invest in Israel. Now, Joyce is concerned 
with uh, an age-old problem called a brain drain. What's your take on this? Um, I think it's not so simple. Like it kills me that 30% of our PhDs in computer science are now teaching abroad, mostly in, in the Ivy League and places like Stanford and uh, Caltech and MIT. That's terrible, right? We pay for them. They go through, grow up in Israel, the army, whatnot, and then they leave, but they don't leave forever. Turns out a lot of them come back. And those that don't come back often work with Israel extensively, come back for summers. They send their kids back. And when you look at the Israelis in Silicon Valley, you know, are the 100,000 Israelis living there a curse or a blessing? And I think you could say mostly a blessing because they provide such a huge you know, connection to the Israeli ecosystem. And I, I think we're mature enough to say Israel is a great place to live today. We don't have to beat people over the head ideologically to say, well, you got to live in, you don't have to live anywhere. You live where you want to live. Israel happens to be a cool, fun place, economically actually a good place to be living if you're a young person. I can make the argument quite effectively that if you want to bring up your kids and send them to a Jewish school and pay day school tuitions, okay, and pay synagogue dues and JCC dues when you go back to a JCC, okay, and you and add all that camps. up, excuse summer me, camps. summer camps, that economically, you got to be making a lot more money in the States. And I'm not sure that that works anymore, okay? I mean, I think Israel is a fine place economically. I don't think we make that case. I don't, you know, in other words, the people who are pitching Aliyah are always pitching it ideologically, fulfill yourself Jewishly, all true, except that I think Jews respond more to, you know, took us in the tish, okay? Tell me, what's the bottom line here? Can I make a living in Israel? And the answer is, if you're young enough and adventurous enough and willing to reinvent yourself, right? Israel doesn't do well for people who don't bend and are flexible. I mean, because Israel is, uh, is tough, okay? People, we don't have a word for tact in our language. It doesn't exist. I've been, if you can help me, you don't, I've never found a word <laughs> for tact, okay? Tact. But, uh, you know, I love it, okay? I, I like knowing where I stand. I, I, I find the connection I feel with the taxi driver or the Yarkhan, the guy in the vegetable store, or, you know, the paquid, the, the, uh, the clerk at the passport office, I have a connection. I feel something. And maybe I'm just a soapy old Zionist, okay? But I, I think that we as a people should be hugely proud of Israel and, and, and what all the Jewish people does. I mean, look at what happened in the last couple of days with these Nobel Prizes. It was almost getting a little bit embarrassing. Enough already with the Jews, okay? We have 30 or 40 percent of the Nobel Prizes in the sciences over the last hundred years, depending upon who you count as Jewish. Where does that come from? Do you know what the percentage of Jews are in the world's population today? It's 20 basis points, two tenths of a percent. And yet we have, you know, over a hundred times over indicated. That's not an, that's not a, you know, the anti-Semites think it's because we don't play fair, right? There's some kind of Jewish conspiracy but anybody who knows how disorganized Jews are knows that there's no conspiracy. It has to do with our attitude towards creativity, towards risk-taking, towards doing something with your life. And it doesn't matter whether it's in high tech or in being a playwright or a great scientist or, you know, writing the next Pulitzer Prize winning, you know, journalist piece. We do things. And I think that you know we now need, as a people, to come together. There are a lot of threats out there still. It's good, but it's a little dangerous. And uh, that's why I think it's just so remarkable that you have things like the Stryker Center and that you know on a early, on a Monday morning, you know, not so early, it's about noontime, I guess, you know, I'm sitting and talking to hundreds of Jews about our survival and our future, you know, Ashreno. It's a, it's a very, means we're, we're, should be very happy 
okay? Because it's Which really, makes yeah. your, your last statement makes it very appropriate for the next question. Marlene is asking, what would you say to a young person, any young person who is interested in um, looking at Israel as a place of opportunity? What, what is the opportunity? And come, what would as you... an come as yeah, an intern. Please. Come you know, on a program like Masa, which brings five or 6,000 young people. Bougie Herzog at the Jewish Agency will appreciate that I'm giving a shout out. They do a great job. There are different programs from universities. Just send me your resume. Have your kids or your grandkids send me their resume. I'll hook you up. We have a full-time person in my company who handles interns. Every year we have between 30 and 40 interns from the top universities all over the world. Let them come for a summer, let them come for six months. It's the new way of, you know, when we were kids, people were kibbutz volunteers. Today you're an intern in a tech company. That's the best way to start, get a feel for it. It'll, you know, that, that's how I, I got here. Okay, as I came for a summer in this experience that we're doing with Birthright, you know, God bless all these guys who put that together okay, and donate, make that possible, okay, uh, it's, it's, it's really about starting, you don't have to make a decision, but, you know, you can follow Israel by going to websites like ours, and getting into these newsletters, and reading about the companies, you can, you know, read, uh, there are multiple Israeli websites, like No Camels, or Israel 21C, that talk about these companies, there, are, you know, the pages of Globes, or the Marker, or the Kalka list, which all have English sections where you can, you know, read this stuff online. It's pretty, if you're interested, it's pretty easy to do it. If you have any issues, just hook me up uh, via John at Arkroud, and I will give you the, the links. Now, and John, there's my, a very interesting my cousin, question. My cousin is sending me love from New Jersey. Hi there, cuz. Alan Spirit, good to hear from you. <laughs> So there's a very interesting question about where do you see the collaboration between Israelis and Palestinians and Israelis and, um, and Arab Israelis and the tech sector. So the Palestinians and the Arab Israelis, and maybe we should say a word also about the, the Orthodox community, the ultra-Orthodox community. What's their interface with this whole world? So, you know, there really there are three groups that are woefully underrepresented in the Israeli tech scene. And it is the Arab Israelis citizens as well as the Palestinians. It is the ultra Orthodox. And you know what the biggest group is, which is underrepresented? Women. Okay, uh, there is a terrible gender problem in, in tech. Uh, both in venture capital funds, we're less than 10. And that's, by the way, not just in Israel, it's in Silicon Valley too. We're less than 10% of the venture partners are, are uh, women you know, founders, about 10%. And we need to work on all kinds of methods to bring more people into this tent. I mean, today we're short of people. We don't have enough people to hire. I mean, one of the horrible things is Israel now has got 960,000 unemployed, most of them on this unpaid furlough, what's called halat in, in Hebrew. Um, but the tech sector, we need 20 or 30,000 people to hire today. I've got in my company, 20 open recs where I'm looking for people. So we need to figure out a way to massively retrain and educate people. So institutions like Mahon Lev, what's called the Jerusalem College of Technology, which trains thousands of Haredi programmers and engineers need to be supported, okay? Organizations that are helping Ethiopians like Machshavat Tova, okay, get into this. By the way, my VP of engineering at my company is an Ethiopian, okay, not, not a programmer, my vice president. He's brilliant, Eli Rata, okay. We need more, okay. We need more Arabs. We've had, uh, you know, Palestinians and Arab Israelis work, you know, for us at different times, but I, I, I could use tons more. Okay, and this is a systemic big problem which needs government attention. It needs more social attention in terms of organizations. And I think, by the way, it's going to be helped by this whole rapprochement with the Gulf. 
I think that people today don't understand how important this normalization is. It is going to really change everything. And it's not just about unlo unlocking tons of money, but this is a country, the UAE and Bahrain, where these people are entrepreneurial. They are leaders in logistics and smart cities and transportation and fintech. And they are, they are just enthusiastic about working with us. This is not like the peace with Egypt and Jordan, which is warming up slowly, but it's taken decades. The, uh, you know, it's just like you get on the phone and people are smiling, okay, ear to ear about how cool this is and how great this is. We have a webinar scheduled. If you're not getting your daily fix of webinars tomorrow, we have a webinar introducing opportunities for Israeli investors in the UAE, and we have 2,000 people signed up. Okay, Amazing. so just to give you an idea of how enthusiastic people are about this. John, this has been incredible. Before we bring this to an end, I'd like to ask you one last question. Obviously, you're very optimistic about Israel's future. Give us two or three main reasons to be cheerful when it comes to the future, beyond the well, headlines. So first of all, we are, despite everything, happy people, okay? Uh, if you look at all the studies, these happiness studies, you know, Israelis always rank in the top 10. You know, Israelis love to party. They like a crowd. That's why we're having such trouble with the COVID regulations. And it doesn't matter whether you're a Haredi or an Arab or a secular Israeli. One could be protesting. One could be, you know, dancing at Simchas Torah. One could be having a, 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 an Arab wedding. And, and we like to be together. It is a happy, wonderful place. Very family oriented. Right, our birth rate is insane. Right, our birth rate right now is over three children per woman. Okay, that's everybody together. That's the entire population. It is child central. Okay, just go to Israel and you, you feel that vibrancy. And I, I think that's a, a very important thing. There's a, a belief in the future that my life is going to get better for me and for my kids. I think that the periphery, you know, the, the north and Kiryat Shmona, the south, we've got a, a medical cannabis incubator, which we're building in Yerucham. We've got our food tech incubator, which we're building in Kiryat Shmona. We've got a cybersecurity incubator we're building in Beersheba. Okay, the periphery is going to be connected with mass transportation. It's not going to be just about the Tel Aviv metroplex. It's going to be the whole country eventually entering into this high-tech story. And finally, Israelis are masters at innovation and creativity. And people say, well, aren't you going to be overwhelmed by the Chinese, the Indians, or other than, you know, up-and-coming tech areas? And the answer is, we are good at the yesh ma'ayin, at the ex nihilo, at the creation of something from nothing, of the ideation. And this is a great place to be. This is where our people, frankly, have been from the beginning, Father Abraham. I mean, he was a dreamer. He saw God, not an idol, okay? His son, Isaac, was a hydrologist, built wells. His grandson, you know, Jacob, was a biotech guy with the, you know, with the sheep, okay? The bottom line is this is in our essence. This is who we are, okay? And we are partners I dare say, I think I can say it on a, uh, a synagogue. Uh, we're partners with God in creation. We don't believe that the world was created in six days, and that's all she wrote. We know that we have to fix the world. The tikkun olam is a imperative. And to the extent that we in Israel can show the way, okay, whether it's on water or on agriculture, on weather, or you know, in terms of transportation or cybersecurity or healthcare or fighting cancer and bring the, 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 all of the positive forces of the Jewish people together, bring investment together, but bring know-how and board members and advisors. This is the way forward. This is the positive message. Now, we have to stop fighting with each other so much. 
Okay, in Israel, the biggest risk is the shiftiyut, is the, the fact that we have tribalism, and there are so many tribes that argue, and, but ultimately we come together. Okay, ultimately I think we share a common past and a, and a common future. And that future is important, not just for us as Jews, but it's important for the entire world. We play an outsized role, a cosmic role in the world. And the, the only real true crisis and tragedy is when our kids opt out, okay? And I don't mean opt out of one religious observance or another, but just opt out. They don't wanna be associated with that story. And so I think it's up to people like us, Ido, you know, the storytellers to say, you know what, this is the biggest gift ever. You're involved, all of us, in this incredible club that's been meeting for over 3,000 years and has had an unbelievable impact on the world. And the best is yet to come. We're, we're working on it. And uh, it's been great talking to you. You know, a lot of fun. You got me all going here. <laughs> well, you, I think you inspired all of us. And I wanted to thank you on behalf of the Temple Emanuel Striker Center community and all the people that are not part of the Striker Center that are on the call. I know that from all over, we have people from all over the country. Uh, this was profound. This was informative. This was inspirational. Thank you so much, John. And I can't wait for our next conversation. I look forward to it very much. God bless you. You will. Shana Take tova, care. Everybody Shana tova. Everybody.